Space is planned. Shuttle astronauts will launch the Magellan space probe toward Venus this evening. Fifteen months from now, the spacecraft will begin orbiting the planet, sending back information which could help us protect Earth. Joining us now live from the Kennedy Space Center is Dr. Lewis Friedman, Executive Director of the Planetary Society. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Can you first explain how Magellan is going to get to Venus once they get it out of the cargo bay? Well, tonight, after they get it out of the car cargo bay, the uh, rocket motor down at the uh, bottom of this mock-up that's here, this isn't the actual spacecraft, will uh, deploy the spacecraft onto an interplanetary trajectory, uh, firing it out of Earth orbit to Venus. It takes a 15-month extra loop around the solar system. It actually goes one and a half revolutions because to take the short path would have required it to launch six months later which is when we're going to launch the Galileo probe to Jupiter. So we couldn't launch two at the same time. So NASA was able to come up with this very ingenious trajectory, which takes 15 months, sort of parks the spacecraft in interplanetary orbit. Then, of course, it'll get to Venus and begin radar operations with the large antenna uh, at the other end of the spacecraft, looking down on the planet and mapping it. How close to Venus does it actually get, and does it, it gets underneath the, 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 the uh, Venus cloud cover? No, the spacecraft itself doesn't get underneath the cl cloud cover. It's in elliptical orbit around Venus, getting within a couple of hundred kilometers uh, to a couple of thousand kilometers as it goes in orbit around Venus. But the radar itself peers through the clouds. Mm. The only way we can see through to the surface, uh, short of being there, is to have a radar which can, uh, like an all-weather uh, instrument, can look through the clouds and see the surface. What do we hope but, to learn from this? Well. To see the surface, we learn both about the interior dynamics and what processes shape the surface, uh, volcanism, plate tectonics, perhaps even uh, continent forming or mountain forming type of uh, uh, processes, as well as learning about the climatological effects, what effects the Venus atmosphere over the uh, history of the planet has had on the surface. And that turns out to be extremely important in such studies as excess carbon dioxide in the Venus atmosphere, teaching us about the greenhouse effect, introduction of aerosols into the Venus atmosphere, teaching us about the atmospheric chemistry related to the ozone evolution, uh, and even the sulfuric acid rain of Venus, which you may know is Venus has sulfuric acid clouds, uh, which make it a kind of hostile place. But that has taught us a great deal about the chemistry of acid rain. So there's a whole history of atmospheric chemistry which we learn from Venus uh, by, studying Earth, uh, by studying it uh, extensively with our spacecraft probes. This has to be a happy end to a long period where we have not had real outer space exploration. It's been over 10 years since America has launched a probe into the planets, and it's been a long and frustrating 10 years because this nation was so active in the 1960s and 70s. We missed out on Halley's Comet, for example, and several other opportunities. But it's of great excitement now that we know that we're returning with this very important mission, uh, with the Galileo mission to Jupiter, which I mentioned, with the Hubble Space Telescope, which will not only image the planets, but of course the whole universe mm -hmm. uh, and parts of it that we've never seen. And then later in the uh, early 1990s, Mars Observer, and we're hoping a comet rendezvous and mission to Saturn in mm -hmm. the late 1990s. So there's a sort of feeling of resurgence right now. Dr. Lewis Friedman, thanks so much for your time this morning. Good to see you. 22 minutes. The Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the latest from there. Peter? Dan, it's been soupy out here all day long, and, uh, but we have just been told by NASA that they plan on resuming the countdown in about 15 minutes. And the problem has been low clouds, and the reason why they can't launch in that condition is that if something were to go wrong and the orbiter had to return here to the Kennedy Space Center for an emergency landing, they wouldn't be able to see the runway. And that obviously would be a very dangerous situation. We've had some intermittent rain, but that seems to have moved off. The problem right now is low, cl low clouds, and with this countdown that we hope to resume here in about 15 minutes, okay, we hope Atlantis still can get into space today. There have been no mechanical problems with the orbiter. The crew is on board, all ready to go. It's just a matter of whether or not Mother Nature is going to cooperate. Peter, let's take a look at uh, the space shuttle Atlantis on the pad there and pick up a little bit of uh, the talk, which uh, no matter how many times you've seen it and heard it, uh, always creates a certain amount of anticipation. Well, NASA uh, talking about uh, when they hope to get out of the hold pattern, 
uh, clouds at a very high altitude uh, and other weather conditions for the moment preventing the launch of uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis, one of the more important Space Shuttle launches because keep in mind that what they hope to do is once this bird gets up, once the shuttle gets up uh, out of its back piggyback cargo compartment, uh, they'll be launching a spacecraft toward Venus and uh, all, all around NASA today there are signs saying Venus or bust. Uh, and they hope to, uh, to launch that Magellan spacecraft uh, once they get the main space shuttle up. But right now, weather preventing it from uh, getting up. The flight of Atlantis. But I'm going to say, will Dan say, Eric Engel? From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Dan Rather. Up in the air over the next uh, 25 minutes or so. Final countdown underway again for the launch of this space shuttle. The shuttle all fueled up and fit to fly again with a crew of five. This after Friday's disappointment, postponement just 31 and seconds the, uh, before blastoff uh, caused uh, by a faulty cells. engine pump and, and fuel line problem. Winds and clouds have been hovering around the margin of what's acceptable in Florida. Clouds, the basic reason why there's been a slight delay in starting the final countdown for today's launch. U.S. Navy Captain David Walker is the mission commander, and the main mission is release of the Magellan spacecraft on a 15-month voyage to map the planet Venus. CBS News correspondent Peter Van Sant is at the Kennedy Space Center with the latest. And Peter, I gather that they want to move the countdown time down a bit to give them maximum window launch time. That's right. Uh, the countdown right now is at about 6 minutes, 46 seconds and counting down, but it's going to stop at 5 minutes because we still have this problem with the clouds in two places. One at the return to launch site, as they call it. That is the landing strip here at the Kennedy Space Center where the, where the orbiter would return in the event of an emergency where they had to come back and land here. The clouds are below 8,000 feet, which is a violation. They have to be higher than that, so we're waiting on those clouds. Also, the range safety people who keep an eye on the shuttle as it climbs into space, they're having trouble with visibility, and uh, that's also in violation right now, so we're hoping that will clear up. So throughout the morning, the, the major concern has been the weather. During the last several hours, the clouds have burned off somewhat. There are some sun breaks, although the sky is still gray. Now NASA managers are also keeping an eye on crosswinds, which have been gusting at times above the safe level to launch for, the, uh, for this crew. And for the five-member crew of Atlantis, it was déjà vu all over again this morning as they prepared to board Atlantis for the second time in less than a week. After a steak and eggs breakfast, the astronauts put on their bulky, uncomfortable flight suits and headed out to Pad 39B. Four of the five astronauts have flown on the shuttle. Last week's launch was stopped just 31 seconds from liftoff after a fuel pump failed. That problem has been corrected, and NASA says Atlantis is ready to fly. There is little room for delay this morning, Dan, because this launch window ends at 2.52 Eastern Time. If they go beyond that point, NASA will have to postpone the launch, and we'll try again tomorrow. Peter, if we may, let's take a look at the clock and call our uh, viewers and listeners' attention to the clock, which is moving, as you see down in the lower right-hand quadrant uh, of the screen. What uh, the NASA officials are doing at the moment, and check me as we go along here, Peter, to make sure this is accurate, is to move the clock down to five, five minutes to go before launch. You've just seen it now. The clock stops at five minutes to launch time. Uh, previously, it, the hold was at nine minutes. They moved it on down to five we minutes because, as you point out, uh, Peter, the weather is satisfactory. Hold on just a second. Other constraints to Let's pick up NASA. Have been cleared. OPC, copy. NTD, copy. NASA just informing the astronauts that the weather conditions have improved and all other indications look like they may get it up. We were explaining that they moved the countdown down to five minutes and are holding it now at five minutes rather than nine because uh, they must get this launch underway in the next 26 and a half minutes. Uh, it's now just past 2.30 Eastern time and they must get this launch up by 57, 2.57. Eastern Time. So they've moved the clock down to five. Uh, NASA has just informed the astronauts who are all buckled in uh, in the space shuttle that things are uh, looking positive, looking optimistic now, and so they may, may underscore the word, get it up this afternoon, uh, some suspense, because they have now only about 26 minutes in which to get that. Reminding that this is CBS News live coverage of both the launch of uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis, indeed if it turns out to be a launch, and 
We are monitoring events in Washington, D.C. The jury says it has a verdict in the Oliver North trial. We do not yet know what the verdict is, and we're monitoring that and will, of course, bring you the results of the verdict as soon as we have them. Back to Space Shuttle Atlantis, sending Magellan to Venice is very tricky business. It's a little like trying to fire a BB gun at a moving target from a speeding airplane. That's why the daily launch window is so precise and not very long. Complicating all this, NASA needs to launch before darkness descends at emergency landing locations around the world, including the early emergency landing location right there at the Kennedy Space Center. Then there's the other larger window. If the small Magellan spacecraft cannot be launched out of the shuttle once it begins orbiting by the end of May, it will be two years before Venus is lined up properly for another try, for another sort of BB shot fired from a moving uh, space shuttle. So that's the reason we have uh, some suspense and some drama in Florida this afternoon. Let's take a review quickly here of the crew aboard this particular shuttle launch, Space Shuttle Atlantis. Commander David Walker, pilot of Discovery, the uh, space shuttle in 1984. Pilot, Ronald Graby, 43, Air Force Colonel, pilot for first flight of Atlantis in 1985. Mission specialist and the only woman aboard this particular flight, Mary Cleave, PhD, who flew in Atlantis in 1985. Uh, mission specialist Mark Lee, 36-year-old Air Force Major. This will be his first space flight. He will actually be in charge of deploying the small Magellan spacecraft toward Venus. And mission specialist Norman Taggart, 45, flew on Challenger in 1983 and 1985. So that's the crew. Uh, Commander David Walker, you can imagine uh, how tense they are there aboard the space shuttle, although uh, with uh, one exception, they're veterans of space flight but it's the sort of thing you never get completely accustomed to, and they've also had the false start. Now let's take uh, a look at the first U.S. interplanetary mission in 11 years. Keep in mind that the United States, partly because of the tragedy aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger, uh, partly because of that, we've not been in the interplanetary exploration uh, business for about 11 years. This will be the first mission in more than a decade for the United States to uh, one of our uh, sister brother planets. So let's go to David Dow, who's standing by at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena for an explanation of exactly what it is that uh, Magellan will be doing once it gets launched to Venus. David? Well, Dan, scientists expect that uh, Magellan will, will give them the closest look that they've ever had of uh, Earth's uh, next-door neighbor, so to speak. Uh, but even more important, they hope that it will launch the U.S. back into another golden era of space exploration. <clears throat> the last U.S. launches to another planet in 1978 were also to Venus and produced some stunning pictures of the dense carbon dioxide clouds that conceal the planet's surface. But the best pictures of that surface so far come from a Soviet radar mapping mission in 1983. After a 15-month journey to Venus, Magellan will go into orbit and send scientists radar images that are expected to be 10 times more detailed than the Soviet pictures. They'll reveal cliffs and canyons of a hostile land where temperatures reach 900 degrees and at least one mountain is a mile higher than Everest. Eventually, the half-billion-dollar mission could produce a map of almost the entire surface of Venus, with the clarity of these pictures of Earth taken by similar radar. Let's switch to uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. In the countdown at T minus two minutes three, and fifty-five seconds, the start just about three minutes until launch time if all goes well. Will Here's CBS News correspondent the Peter Van Sant on the scene. of the main engines will be terminated. We got to go for weather. Uh, it's been spotty. Uh, we've been hoping for some sun breaks. They've, they've, they've managed to get some breaks, not only in the clouds, but in the crosswinds that they were very nervous about. They just uh, gimbaled the, uh, the three main engines, which you can see here. Gimbling means they move them around. That's how they steer the shuttle as it, as it moves up into space. And right now, uh, things are all go, and uh, we shall see if the weather holds for the next uh, two minutes, 35 seconds. Well, that sets the scene, Peter Van Sant. So let's you and I be quiet and watch and listen and hope they get it away as uh, they begin pulling away the equipment in hopes the space shuttle Atlantis can get up and away this afternoon. The pilot, Ron Graby, has cleared the caution and warning memory. The crew will be reminded to close their visors on their launch and entry helmets at the two-minute point. Just five seconds away from that. OTC to flight crew, close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. 
and have a good flight. And PLT OTC, turn on debris camera at T minus 10 seconds. T minus one minute, 50 seconds and uh, counting. Liquid hydrogen uh, replenish of the external tank has started and pressurization to flight level is underway. We are ready to fly. Copy that. Command. We'll go on the debris camera. Copy that. Commander Dave Walker saying they're ready to fly. T minus one minute, 30 seconds and counting. At the T minus one minute point, the ground launch sequencer will verify that the shuttle main engines are ready to start. T minus one minute, 20 seconds and counting. The liquid hydrogen tank now at flight pressure. Coming up on the one minute point in our countdown. T minus one minute and counting. The sound suppression water system is now armed. Pre-lift off water will be released at T minus 16 seconds. T minus 50 seconds and counting. The hydrogen burn igniters have been armed. They'll burn off any residual hydrogen gas under the main engines. T minus 40 seconds and counting. The external tank heaters on the ET to orbiter structural attachments have been turned off. Orbiter computers have, uh, and we have gone for auto sequence start. T minus 26 seconds, 25. T minus 21 seconds, the SRB nozzle gimbal profile underway. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. We have a go for main engine start. Seven, six, we have main engine. Two, one, zero, and liftoff. The new era of planetary science begins as Atlantis clears the tower. Four engines to throttle down. All three engines will be throttled back to 65% performance as the vehicle passes through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Three engines now at 55%. Velocity now 1,000 feet per second. Atlanta is two miles downrange. percent performance. Atlantis velocity now 1,500 feet per second. Go and throttle up. Atlantis, Atlantis, Roger, go. Standing by for a separation from the SRBs. Velocity now 2,000 feet per second. Altitude 10 nautical miles. Downrange distance 8 nautical miles. External solid rocket tanks dropping away. This is Mission Control, all APUs looking good. Three engines at 104%. That'll happen in about 12 seconds. Solid rocket booster separation. Space shuttle now this continuing to head control, towards space SRB on uh, liquid fuel. Velocity 4,300 feet per second. Atlantis downrange 35 nautical miles at an altitude of 30 nautical miles. The voice is the mission Three control. All looking good at Billy Deason, first female ascent communicator. And you probably heard at about the one minute and six second mark, the command was given, Atlanta, go it throttle up. Nominal. This is mission control. Which nobody control, will hear it anymore crew without the thinking of the Space Shuttle the Challenger and its brave crew, which at that command, the Space Shuttle disintegrated.
But this one, Space Shuttle Atlantis, is on its way. Everything looking good. Five brave astronauts riding the fire. Hoping to uh, Atlantis, launch the Magellan spacecraft. Have made it. This is a replay of the Two, launch. Here we go to Venus. One, zero, and liftoff. The familiar roll, the spacecraft is uh, rolled over, in effect, on its back to help it aerodynamically. A familiar sight with the uh, shuttle liftoffs these days. And when we say, and say correctly, here we go to Venus, what we mean, of course, is once Space Shuttle Atlantis gets into its uh, set orbit, they're going to launch that marvelously complicated and wonderful instrument, the Magellan, tiny spacecraft which will be headed for a long voyage to explore the Velocity molten hot planet of Venus. And this is replay again from a different camera. One, zero, and liftoff. And perhaps an even more exciting uh, liftoff sight and sound today than we've been accustomed to uh, the last several space shuttle launches because of the historic significance of this one with the hopes of getting that Magellan spacecraft headed toward Venus once Atlantis Mission gets up Control, and gets Atlantis into orbit. You can see uh, now we try to give you the figures, the statistics, downrange 213, 14 miles, miles, altitude 67.1 miles up, and the speed uh, well, well over 7,000 miles per hour. That's 7,000 miles per hour. And we're five minutes into the mission. With me here at our CBS News headquarters in New York, Michael Collins, former astronaut. Michael, here is yet another replay of Atlantis going up. No matter how many times you've seen it, always gives you a little twinge and tingle on the back of your neck. Hanger with only five minutes left in the launch window, Dan. I bet they were really uh, getting a little anxious inside. Well, it's hard to, not to just watch and listen, even though we're into our third week of it. Uh, the tremendous power that it takes to get this spacecraft up into orbit. No matter how many times we explain, we always like to review very quickly that the solid rocket boosters long pencil-like boosters on each side uh, help provide the thrust to get the big space shuttle up, then they drop away. You saw that a while back, and now the space shuttle attached to its uh, liquid fuel tank makes its way up to its orbit position, and then the big liquid fuel Atlantis tank will drop away, and Atlantis will be left with its uh, maneuvering engines, which are in the tail of, of the spacecraft. Michael Collins, at this point, we're into six minutes and 20 seconds uh, into the launch. The astronauts, by this time, they cannot rest easy. They cannot be fully confident and secure, but they're beginning to feel pretty good that they're going to make it up into orbit and their mission will be successful. Well, I think they're always concerned as long as those big motors are churning away. They, uh, they'll feel a lot better about 10 minutes after launch when suddenly they find themselves floating weightless in their straps. Let's talk a bit about the mission. Michael Collins, we've said, well, here we go to Venus. We do not literally mean that the astronauts are going to Venus. They're going to go up there uh, into orbit, and then they're going to launch the uh, robot spacecraft. I don't like the word robot myself, but nonetheless, there it is, the uh, spacecraft, the Magellan, which will come out of the back, the what we might call the trunk, the cargo space uh, of the shuttle, and it'll be headed toward Venus on a long voyage. Uh, to what purpose? Okay, we're going to Venus, that's terrific, but why? What, ho what do we hope to accomplish from this? Well, scientists would like to understand, Dan, a little more about how planets work. And, uh, of course, the planet we're worried about is planet Earth. But having a, a second planet like Venus to compare with Earth is an extremely uh, helpful and powerful tool in that process. Uh, for example, Venus used to have water on it no longer. What happened to the water? Why did it disappear? What does that mean for the oceans of our own planet? Very good point. As we watch the launch of Space uh, Shuttle Atlantis once again and make that familiar role, that uh, keeping in mind that Venus once had water on it, 
what happened to that water? What could that mean for our own oceans? There have been, uh, in recent years, quite a bit of concern expressed about the possible uh, heating up of our own planet uh, and what that will mean for ocean evaporation. So by uh, getting this Magellan launched toward Venus, which we hope to have done now that uh, Atlantis is headed toward its orbit, we, it may begin to give us some clues as to what happened to that water. Exactly. We worry about the greenhouse effect here on Earth. Venus has an incredibly powerful greenhouse effect, and studying one of that uh, intensity, I think, will be a good help to us here. Just got main engine cut off, Michael. So the main engine in the... Uh, this is mission control. Main engine cutoff has been confirmed. Well, we pause to hear uh, NASA confirm that. Main engine cut off now. This nice. is the external tank separation from the third shuttle flight, close up of it. Seeing those solid rocket boosters drop away. And and we see a nominal fall back into the ocean and get reused. Well, you just heard uh, the uh, astronauts saying that things looking very good indeed for Atlantis as it uh, moves toward the position in which it can begin uh, to make its orbit. Uh, the first orbit uh, is uh, always considered uh, among the, the more dangerous, uh, for obvious reasons, I think, because you're not quite sure that you're absolutely in the right orbit, and that's the reason you have all these places around the Earth for emergency landing sites. Well, that's exactly right, Dan. If it should just limp across the Atlantic, it can come down in North Africa or in Spain. Uh, if it makes it beyond that, it could always come back in and land out in Southern California at Edwards Air Force Base, but of course, uh, the likelihood is that it'll just keep going and it'll be up for the entire four-day flight. Well, we'll knock on this wood uh, that uh, they won't need to be making any emergency landings anywhere that they can get the mission accomplished. Uh, reminding you, this is CBS News live coverage of both the uh, launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis and the Oliver North uh, verdict. The jury is in. Oliver North convicted on three criminal counts, found not guilty on nine. We'll be going back to that story very shortly, but first let's go to David Dow at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, uh, California. David, uh, very quickly, because we're going to get back to the uh, North uh, verdict, we, we had to cut you off when the verdict uh, became known uh, in your excellent report about uh, Venus. Uh, when, David, do we figure to know uh, for certain that they're going to be able to get the Magellan spacecraft launched toward Venus? Uh, Venus? Well, they will uh, commence the, the steps leading to the launch of, of Magellan about six hours into the mission. It will be uh, lifted up on a, a sort of tilt table uh, apparatus, uh, cut adrift, much as we've seen other large uh, satellites uh, launched in the past, and then a two-stage booster rocket will fire it off toward the planet. Of course, it'll take uh, 15 months to get there uh, and to begin transmitting data back. Eventually, of course, it's supposed to map the entire planet in much the same way uh, as we have maps of, of our planet. What a great time to be alive in this country with these kind of explorations taking place. Main mission, sending the Magellan Radar Mapper spacecraft off on a 15-month voyage to explore the planet Venus. This will be the first U.S. space project to explore another planet since 1978. CBS News correspondent Peter Van Sant has the latest from the Kennedy Space Center. The shuttle Atlantis in space, preparing for its number one mission, the release of the Magellan spacecraft which will begin an 800 million mile journey to map the planet Venus. We've got an American crew back in space. We've got uh, NASA science uh, heading back to the planets. It was a mission which almost didn't get off the ground. Yeah, the low ceiling conditions uh, make us no go at the moment for rain safety. Low clouds and gusting crosswinds forced NASA to delay the launch. Then with less than five minutes to go before the launch would have to be scrubbed, the troublesome weather cleared and Atlantis roared into space. Six, we have made it. Two, one, zero, and liftoff. Atlantis's climb into space was flawless, leaving relieved NASA managers with a happy ending to a suspense-filled day. The release of the Magellan spacecraft marks the rebirth of the U.S. space science program, which has remained dormant and grounded for more than 10 years. All those years aren't down the drain, that's for sure. We've got off to a good start here. Using powerful radar, Magellan will map the surface of Venus, solving some of the mysteries of that cloud-shrouded planet. Two more planetary satellites will be carried aboard shuttles in the next year, but some scientists worry about relying on the shuttle, remembering that the Challenger accident wasn't just a disaster for NASA, but also for the U.S. space science program. Peter Van Sant, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. Space probe Magellan on the long voyage to Venus. James Satori is standing by at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Good morning, James. 
Good morning, Charlie. Those astronauts are sleeping in, but NASA engineers are wide awake this morning and very pleased with the progress of the mission thus far. Atlantis fulfilled its primary objective just six hours after liftoff Amateur with the successful Atlantic launching of the unmanned Magellan probe, now streaking to Venus at 25,000 miles per hour. The spacecraft is, is performing just beautifully. Magellan will travel for 15 months, then spend another eight months scanning Venus with a 12-foot radar dish. Scientists hope to unlock secrets shrouded by the dense atmosphere surrounding the planet closest to Earth. We'll map the entire globe at, uh, at extremely high resolution, enough to uh, really get uh, a good geological and geophysical in insight into what's going on on the surface of Venus.